Well, joining us now to speak further on this new policy is one of the delegates, uh, and that's the chairman, House Committee on Foreign Affairs, Honorable Nena Ukeje. Mary, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Yes. You were part of the delegation to that inauguration. And um, basically, what President Trump seems to be saying is that there will be no more wastage of America's taxpayers' money on countries who are not showing results for it in Africa. In fact, he says it, the U.S. funding will be targeted to key countries in strategic uh, uh, objectives. Tell us, how is Nigeria benefiting from this? And is Nigeria benefiting from this policy? Oh, well, um... It's very interesting that you start the question that way, because um, evidently this is in line with the United States' campaign promises of keeping America first. Now, in the entire speech, um, there was not one mention of Nigeria. However, this um, United States policy is pronged on a tripod, um, aid to Africa, um, rolling back on the counter-terrorism -terror and the counter-terrorism war and trade and investment with Africa. Um, we're very concerned that as a country which unfortunately is, is called number three on the terrorism index, one of the most terrorized countries in the world, that if the United States foreign policy with regards to counter-terrorism was concerned, would at least have expected that a mention would have been made of Nigeria on the continent. Now, um, f for mention was the G5 um, Sahel group, which, of course, they congratulated for doing great work as far as um, turning back the tide on counterterrorism is concerned. And um, one of those, uh, the five countries are Mauritania, Niger, Chad, um, <coughs> Mali, uh, uh, and, you know, Nigeria was not mentioned either. So... But I believe that on the larger continents, there's absolutely no way there'll be an African roadmap or an African plan without the Nigerian component within that. So I believe that even though it was, a, it was not a granular policy statement, it was one that was spoken about in very generic terms, I believe that at the end of the day, when we bore down into the policy statement, that Nigeria will be a beneficiary of it. However, um, a lot of people have also said that what this is, because on the United States policy um, leaderboard would be China at the very top and Africa, of course, at the bottom. And a lot of people have said that this should be renamed the um, African component of the Chinese, of the American China policy. Now, um, what can Nigeria do? I think this is an opportunity that rather than African Nigeria seeing itself as a pawn in a global chess game, that it is time for us to start to renegotiate um, Nigeria's stance as far as um, global policies are concerned because evidently Africa has suddenly become the beautiful bride because of the Chinese interest in Africa and which has precipitated the American interest in Africa and that is what a lot of people are saying. Um, we find it rather curious that President Muhammad Buhari, the leader of Africa's largest economy and market, was absent at the lunch. Why was this the case? Well, um, a lot of, it was a very busy week for um, Nigeria on the capital, and um, there was a lot of goings-on interest in Nigeria, and I think that it was just coincidental that um, the parliament or the Congress was invited, the Congress invited its counterparts in the Nigerian parliament to come and be part of it, because that same week there was a congressional hearing on Nigeria about the elections, forthcoming elections, and most of the time in most countries, parliamentarians would deal with parliamentarians with a lot of issues, and I think that was the reason um, I'm not speaking for the executive. I have absolutely no reason to understand why um, the president wasn't there, but I can speak for parliament and say that reciprocity as far as parliamentary practices are concerned is one that is always respected between in both parliaments and the United States Congress invited members of the Nigerian parliament and that's why we were there. Another aspect of that trip that raised eyebrows was the partisan nature of the delegation from the legislature. From what we could tell, every person on that trip was either a member of the opposition People's Democratic Party or African Democratic Congress. Why were there, there no members of the ruling All Progressives Congress included on the team that traveled to the U.S.? After all, what you went for was bipartisan in all its ramifications. Oh, well, um, I'm sure if you had looked at the list, you'd have realized that it was the Senate president, 
Senator Ben Bruce, who was in charge, who was in charge of media. There was myself, um, Chair of Foreign Affairs, and my Senate counterpart, who was of the ADC. She was formerly of the APC. Unfortunately, she could not make it because she was campaigning, and that's the reason for it. It wasn't deliberate. It just happens that our designations um, so happened to have fallen into that kind of um, party uh, arrangement, and, you know, it wasn't yes, deliberate. Yes, Honorable, but, but I, this is as we said in the question. Not. Honorable, this is as we said in the question. There was no APC member. It was PDP and ADC. No APC. Well, you know, I mean, what was I supposed to do? Change my political party? <clears throat> it, we went there because of our designations. I am chair of foreign affairs. I am of the PDP. The chair of the Senate House of Rep uh, the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs was formerly of the APC. She just converted. So it was about the. Um, people who had anything to do with, with the mission. There was the Senate President, and then there was the Chair of Foreign Affairs of the House, there was the Chair Senate of the um, Foreign Affairs Committee, as well as the Chair of the um, Media and Publicity. So it just, it was purely coincidental. Honorable, as the Chair of Foreign Affairs, um, how would you assess a foreign policy thrust under this current administration of President Mohammed Buhari? Well, um, I'd say that foreign policy is, is very um, dynamic, exceedingly dynamic. And um, Mr. President, in his inaugural speech, had said that Nigeria would be willing to lead, to, um, lead in any um, leadership position she finds herself. Now, a lot of things have happened in the past. Nigeria has been beset by a lot of concerns, um, the counterterrorism war, um, the recession, and in foreign policy, might is normally right. But I'd say that um, with regards to certain issues, Nigeria has shown um, some leadership. For instance, Nigeria showed some leadership in the Gambia. But um, in other things, a lot of people have said that the Nigeria's foreign policy has not been as vibrant as it, as it should be. Um, Nigeria, of course, a lot of our economics, uh, economics is tied into foreign policy. Defense is tied into foreign policy. Our migration policy is tied into foreign policy. And a lot of people will probably say that as far as the economy is concerned, that hasn't done very well. Um, there's a lot of migration, unfortunately, forced migration because of the the economy and all that is tied into Nigeria's foreign policy. But I'd say that with regards to Nigeria's foreign policy, everybody's asked certain questions. How are we going to fund the foreign policy? And um, a lot of foreign policy, of course, is, t is tied into funding. Um, fortunately, 0.05% um, of the national budget has been committed to foreign policy. And when that happens, you find that it is almost impossible to run your foreign policy on a shoestring. And so we probably don't have as vibrant a foreign policy as we would um, normally have. Again, most of it is tied into releases, most of it is tied into budget, and most of it is tied into the funding of Nigeria's foreign policy. Nigeria has a very robust, ambitious foreign policy. Unfortunately, it hasn't been funded in the way that we would expect it to be. And that has direct consequences on Nigeria's leadership role in the region, in the sub-region, and continentally. Again, like I said, um, Nigeria's um, economic woes, unfortunately, have also had a huge, huge impact on driving Nigeria's foreign policy. Um, it's very difficult for you to earn and gain respect and keep the respect when you, of course, probably are not able to pull your weight as far as um, foreign institutions are concerned, bilateral, multilateral agreements are concerned. And so that has taken its toll on Nigeria's foreign policy. So um, would I say that we've done very well? I'd say that a lot needs be done. I think that Nigeria must have a serious, proper conversation about funding of our foreign policy, clear cut direction as to where we want to go, um, image of Nigeria's missions abroad, and what our clear um, deliverables are. I think there has to be a great um, amount of conversation about what Nigeria wants to do, where we want to take our foreign policy to. I don't think that there's a very clear cut direction with regards to that in the last couple of years. And there's much, much, a lot of work that has to be done. All right, Honorable. Let's move on to what transpired during the joint session of the National Assembly yesterday when the president came to present the 2019 budget. The session was rather rowdy with pro- and anti-Buhari legislatures disrupting the president as he presented the budget. What was that all about? Why were, why were some of your colleagues angry, despite attempts made by the speaker to stop them from heckling the president?
Um, well, I'd say that, you know, I think that democratic processes and democratic institutions all over the world, if you want the freedom to express yourself, then that's democracy at play. Um, a lot of our colleagues were concerned about the fact that another budget had come up and yet um, the previous budgets had not been implemented. Now the concerns, of course, and I understand that somebody had said I should worry about we're funding the budget rather than um, the implementation of the budget. But we also made the point last year when they brought the budget that that was a very ambitious budget. Um, this is, we, we, a lot of people decided that it was time for them to express their um, displeasure at the fact that the budget was not funding. Do I agree or not agree with the way that in which that was done? That's a conversation for another day. But I still think that the ability and the, um, of Nigerians to understand that everywhere in the world that there is heckling in Parliament, that people will express their displeasure, that people serve at the pleasure of their constituents, and if their constituents are angry, it is the job of the parliamentarian to collate the aggregate opinion of a critical mass of the people that they, um, that they represent and to, and to observe or to heighten or to express that displeasure to, to, to the people. Now, um, many people will say to me that, um, have said that the parliament acted childishly. A lot of people have said, you know, why would the parliament behave like that? And I made the point yesterday that our parliament has always been across the aisle. It's always been bipartisan, it's always been across the aisle. But I think that when you look at the Nigerian parliament, it is reflective of the larger Nigerian society. We have never had a Nigeria that is more divided, that has been more het up, that is more quick to reaction than this time. And for me, and I say it over and over again, that this is indicative of what is likely to happen in the runoff to the elections if something is not done to ensure that the Nigerian people believe that the process is free, it is fair, it is credible. That is just indicative of the divisiveness and the anger that resonates in the land. And I think that we need to look beyond what we have termed a show of shame or an embarrassment at the National Assembly to look at how it is reflective and indicative of the larger Nigerian society and to actually start to have preemptive issues and things to mitigate against what is likely to happen in the event that the people that any that they disagree with anything coming out of government. Well, would you care to expand on this? Because you did make a statement yesterday on the floor of the House that at the rate that things are going, Nigeria will not have a free and fair election next year. This is an incendiary comment, and which you have just reiterated. Can you just expand on exactly why you made that remark? What are the indications that you're seeing? It is not incendiary. Incendiary would assume or would suggest that it is to... It is to heat up the polity. I, it was a note of warning. A lot of Nigerians, Nigeria is very divided. I have found a lot of people who are more quick to anger than they ever have been. And I don't know if you have noticed it, but I have noticed it that Nigerians have suddenly started going back into their cleavages. All of a sudden, your Yoruba or Igbo or Hausa, this has never happened. I've run in three elections. The National Assembly has always been an across the aisle National Assembly. That in spite of where you came from, or who you were, that we all work together in the interest of the Nigerian people. You found that even the senators who are often more um, controlled than us, there was also an incident on the side of the, Senate, of the senators. And I continue to say that this has never happened. This is new in Nigeria. And for us, if we look at all the divisiveness, the headsman killings, the, 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 the amount of death, the insecurity, the anger, the hunger, you see that all those things are very, very, I mean, Nigeria is sitting on a keg of gunpowder. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting that the topic of the congressional hearing on Nigeria was Nigeria at crossroads. Now, when you hear those kind of um, signals, or when you read those kind of signals coming from around the world, then it is time for us to actually start to look inwards and start to take a cursory look at exactly what the circumstances. I said yesterday, I mean, the lack of signing of the Electoral Act has heightened the anger within the land. There's, there's more suspicion. And I constantly say that we must 
start to home inwards. As political leaders and as politicians, it is imperative that we look at the electoral process and make sure that the electoral process is one that is a judge to be credible by everybody. The National Assembly has never been so fraught with tension and anger. I have been in the National Assembly for 11 years, and if we choose not to look at those as indicators of the fact that the people running up to the elections, the tension is high, if we refuse or we decide to ignore all those um, dog whistles, then, you know, it's, it's all up to us if, if that happens. And, but what I said I don't believe was incendiary. All I said was for us to take a cursory look and understand the indicators that every other person seems to be seeing except us. Yeah, Honorable, uh, analysts uh, fear or say that the 2019 budget is about to go the fate of others uh, despite plans and promises to regularize uh, the budget here. Now that it has been presented, when should Nigerians expect the legislature to pass it with the Christmas, Christmas breaks uh, just around the corner and electioneering ongoing? Well, the medium-term expenditure framework would have to be dispensed with. And, um, and then we're going to have to engage with the uh, ministries, departments, and agencies. And then after that, we'll ha have the um, budget ready for signing. So it would all depend on the processes that would have to go through for the uh, budget process. All right. Um, so, Honorable, you're a three-time member. Can, can you hear us? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, I can. Okay. So you're a three-term member of the House of Representatives, highly regarded by your colleagues in the National Assembly, and have shown a commitment to public service that is admirable. But unfortunately, you did not secure the ticket of your party, the PDP, to recontest the elections next year. What should we expect from you as you prepare to face a new chapter in your political trajectory? I'm going to go back to school, and probably I'm going to write um, to Arise Television and look for your job. <laughs> that is so sweet. There are no openings here. <laughs> you, 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 are, you are more than okay, welcome well, to join us. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, Honorable, oh, really? and on a personal note. Your mother, a well-known jurist, was the first female chief judge of the Federal High Court of Nigeria, while your late father was a decorated pilot with the Nigerian Air Force and defunct Nigerian Airways. What role did your parents play in instilling the values that have helped you navigate the murky terrain of Nigerian politics? It was yin yang. My mother was very strict. My father was very nice. And so he, they've taught me to play the good cop, bad cop. And you know, it's up to you to decide whether I'm doing a good job of it. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Honorable. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank well, you very much and have a very Merry Christmas. And you too. <laughs> All right. It's time now for a short break. When we return, the Managing Director of Access Bank PLC, Herbert Wigwe, will be joining us to discuss details of the bank's merger of Diamond Bank PLC. Do stay with us.